I'm Nick Ryan. I'm a music composer, sound designer, uh, artist, and audio media specialist. My clients and my directors often expect me to be conventional, but what they really want is a different idea uh, to everyone else. I have to listen really, really carefully all the time. Most people don't know how to listen, and if you learn how to listen, you'll be different to most people. You have to be able to care deeply about what you do, but not in isolation. You have to be able to collaborate with other people. And if you're collaborating, ultimately you have to be able to let go of your work as part of a bigger project. The first and most important thing was to come up with a story. Um, and our previous game, Papa Sangre, was set in, in Mexico, in a, a Mexican underworld, and we decided to set this one in space. So we came up with a story, we came up with a location, then we started to edit levels um, and create the actual structure of this, this, this world. Um, and then we started to create its inhabitants, um, be they monsters or um, protagonists. Uh, and then we started to populate those levels and decide where those different um, audio objects had to go. Um, and then, of, of course, we had to play test extensively. One of the things we encountered by in making a, an audio-only game is that um, there's a huge amount of subjective interpretation among our, pl our, our, our players. So it's quite important for us to be sure that what we as game designers think we're making is what our players perceive it to be. Some of the most significant decisions we made on Nightjar were to, um, firstly, to build our own game engine, uh, because nothing really existed before this game to render 3D sound in real time um, on, a, on a handheld device. Uh, and we could, have, we could have used an existing engine, uh, but that wouldn't have really given us the flexibility that we needed, uh, and in the long run would have caused all sorts of other problems, such as licensing, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we actually built our engine um, ourselves. So also, when we decided to make a game that was sound only, we realized we had to immerse the player in a sound world that was believable. And as you know, our own world is 3D, um, it's kind of unremarkable. We're used to listening in 3D, um, but recordings are generally 2D um, because they're recorded with stereo microphones and they don't really mimic the way that we hear as humans. So what we used is a, is a technique uh, called binaural recording and our game engine actually renders sound in real time binaurally. <clears throat> what that means is that we're actually mimicking the way we hear as humans. The reason we can tell whether sound is not just to the left or the right of us, but also above or beneath us, in front of us or behind us, is because we've got two ears and our brains actually make um, comparisons between what our left ear hears and what our right ear hears. And uh, it makes comparisons according to volume, uh, time arrival, and frequency. And when you put those three, th three things together, you can actually create a 3D recording. And the easiest way to do that is to place a microphone in each ear and use your head uh, as the encoding tool, if you like. The tools I use are, some of, some of the tools I use are, 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 are what everyone else uses who, who's, who's making sound, logic, audio, and pro tools. Um, but I also use lots of specialist um, plugins, lots of specialist software to render sound in 3D. I've got one tool that's very good for placing things behind you. I've got one tool that's very good for high frequency things. Um, and that's largely to do with the shape of head that was used to make their original algorithms. Um, I then use um, various microphones, including a, a dummy head, which has microphones in each ear, and it looks like a crash, crash test dummy. And we use that to actually make, make real recordings. Um, and in terms of the game itself, the game consists of um, atmospheres, um, which are looped, uh, objects which move relative to you, objects which don't move relative to you, which are attached to your person, like your footsteps, um, and also um, dialogue. And dialogue is, is a vital component of this, and we were lucky enough to have uh, Benedict Cumberbatch um, as our, our main talent on this. The crew of the Nightjar left you here as bait. Now the crew of the rescue ship are dead. And you will be too, 
in minutes if you don't get off this ship. We had to make a decision um, about whether to go for realism um, over abstraction. Uh, and what we discovered was that we couldn't really um, go abstract without exposition. And it was a fascinating process because what we ended up doing was trying to use narrative. Narration became vital in enabling our players to understand what it was that they were listening to. So without any narration or any, any um, sort of narrative setup, uh, the interpretation that our players were open to was massive. Uh, they would perceive a completely different space um, to each other. So we had to set the scene with fairly realistic uh, sounds, sounds that we have an innate recognition of and an understanding of their physical form. We, we can actually visualize in our imagination what object is making that sound. But once we've established that, we can then introduce, providing there is some explanation of it through narrative, we can actually introduce objects which are, are, are more abstract. Um, and monsters, uh, for example, are, uh, are something which we, un we, we expect to be abstract and we welcome subjective interpretation of because they then become much more frightening. The game did turn out um, mostly as we expected it to, but there are so-called bugs, um, which came from people's different interpretations of what they were hearing. So we might have put in what we thought was a monster, and, um, and, and a particular player might have perceived it to be um, a, uh, a toilet flushing in the next door room, uh, rather than a, a monster crawling up the wall. You, you know, you never really know, so we had to extensively play test this and then tune tune the actual sounds as well. In the absence of images, we can't help but hallucinate in images in our imagination, um, as we do when we listen to radio. And that kind of age-old cliche, pictures are better on radio, um, stands with the Nightjar. We, you know, we've said jokingly that the Nightjar has the best graphics engine uh, in the world because it's your imagination. Um, and What's particularly um, exciting about being nominated for the Nightjar for audio achievement is that um, this is uh, an audio-only experience, and that's, that's quite a unique proposition. The thing that I'm most proud of is that um, people who are used to listening, um, people who are blind, or visually impaired wrote to us and told us that this was an incredibly believable three-dimensional immersive space. Um, and I would ex have expected um, they in particular to have picked up on some of the, some of the, the flaws uh, in the sound design um, and they, 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 were very, um, they were very complimentary about it, although they did say that the game was, was far too easy, uh, so we did have to make it harder. Um, I'm also very proud of the fact that we managed to um, keep our golden rule intact, the golden rule uh, of all, which was not to have any visual representation of space whatsoever. And um, we were tempted throughout the process to have some kind of sort of map, um, but we, we, um, we decided to be strict with ourselves. And now there is no, nothing to see. Um, you place your thumbs on the screen, you walk with your thumbs as though they're your feet. The interface is intuitive and you can play the game with your eyes closed.